What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Zach Kravitz, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a positive rating and review. The more positive ratings and reviews you get, the more time to find the show. It really helps to grow the community that we're developing. Every one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. I put out brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode as an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. Last but not least, if you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to share it to your Instagram story. Tag myself at the Jacob Kelly, tag Zach and add Zach Kravitz. And I'll feature you on my account and send you a message as well. And now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Zach Kravitz. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And today on the podcast, we are joined by Zach Kravitz. Zach is a former freelance videographer who has worked with the likes of GEZ, Pusha T, and Lewis Howes. And now Zach runs an online course called The Creator's Blueprint, which is a proven system that turns people's creative ambitions into a timeless brand. And I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today, Zach. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I love the intro. Damn, you're good at this, bro. <laughs> you are good. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, man. It's I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here, man. Where I want to start today, I want to go all the way back to the beginning and talk to me about growing up in the suburbs of Chicago. Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's not much to talk about there. There's really not much going on. Um, where, where, where did you grow up? by the way. So I, I'm based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada right now. Okay. And so I lived there till I was nine. And then I moved to the prairies to a town called Portage La Prairie in Manitoba, Canada. And then I moved back here for school because the rest of my family was here other than my dad. And I just stayed here. Okay. So you don't know the Northwest suburbs of Chicago then at all? I don't know. <laughs> okay. It's quiet. I mean, it's the Midwest. You've heard of the Midwest before, right? Mm-hmm. Very, um, very, uh, very privileged childhood. No no crazy come up story by any means. I was, you know, I was a big athlete. Um, so I played golf and volleyball in high school. Um, I had a, I had a phenomenal childhood. I, I really just, you know, love my parents. My, my parents are some of my best friends. I, I mean, I put my dad in my YouTube videos all the time. So anybody that watched those old videos, like you guys know that, um, yeah, he, he's a, he's like my best friend, but, um, yeah, great, great childhood. It wasn't until college that I was like, really trying to discover who I was and and what I was all about and didn't really have a good college experience, didn't have a lot of friends, very like introverted and just, uh, it just felt like I couldn't connect with anyone. And I thought, you know, I thought it all reflected back on to who I was being and like, it was my fault. And so yeah, I was just not, I was not the happiest guy in school and it just wasn't a good experience. Um, but then once I got out of college and started to dive into the things that I really wanted to pursue is when I started meeting really cool people and started to build my own tribe, um, and meet cool people like Babin, for example, that you had on, uh, recently, it sounds like. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, Northwest suburbs, of Chicago, nothing to complain about very very good childhood and uh yeah can't complain and so you mentioned you were good at both volleyball and golf and from my understanding you're the 2009 illinois junior golf association player of the year damn where where are you finding this thanks google (laughs) you did your research yeah i i I guess yeah i I was back in the day back wait wait, was that golf or, or volleyball it was golf it was golf I don't even remember that, man. That was a long time ago. Um, yeah, I was, I was a big golfer. I, I played golf since I was like five years old um, and then started competing in eighth grade um, and then played high school. I made the varsity golf team freshman year of high school. Um, and I just, you know, golf is one of those things. I, I wasn't expecting to talk about it, but now that I'm thinking about it, golf is one of those things where if you don't have that mental game, uh, I mean, it just, it tests you so much. And I'm just curious if I had maybe the mental strength that I do now 
back then when I started playing golf, I, I wonder if I would have kept going. But my point in saying that is I just, I just couldn't handle the mental game of competing. And so after sophomore year, I, I, I didn't come back. And I actually love volleyball, the, the competition of volleyball a lot more. And I had, I had a lot more confidence in volleyball. And so I wanted to go all in on volleyball. And I was going to end up playing college. Um, but anybody that listens to this that knows men's volleyball back in 20. 11 is when I graduated high school, I think. Coll men's college volleyball was not big unless you were playing Division One, And, you know, I, I just – I wasn't good enough. I wasn't tall enough, and I wasn't – I just wasn't good enough to really be a, a player at that Division One level. I would have been, like, a practice player. I got recruited um, to, to be, like, a practice player for some D1 schools and then uh, to be the – one of the top players for division three schools, but D three schools are so small and they're schools you've never even heard of. Um, and I just, I, I visited them and I just didn't like them. So I decided to, to not play. So. I'm, yeah. I want to stick on volleyball just for a minute. Cause I played volleyball competitively sure. my whole life growing up and around that oh, time. Cool. Yeah. Around, around that time you made the switch where you stopped playing golf and went all in was part of that decision. The fact that you were getting recruited by UCLA. Man, you got you really did your research, man. This is great. Um, I don't think anybody has asked me that ever. That's hilarious. Um, that's such a good question. Damn, did that affect my? <sighs> You're really taking me back to those days, man. This is crazy. Um, I want to say no. I don't think it did. Um, I just. I don't even know. I don't even remember if I got recruited to UCLA after I think I, I, I got recruited after I decided not to play golf my junior year of high school, but I could have that totally wrong, but um, I don't, I don't think it, it had that effect on it. That, that's a funny story because I don't know if you know, maybe you did because you're asking me these questions in the first place, which is hilarious, but um, they, they didn't call me back after that one year that they sent me that recruiting letter and, and talked to me. Um, I, I must have just not been the guy anymore. But I still loved volleyball, and I wanted to do whatever it took to, to play at a competitive level. But then when I went to go actually visit these schools, I'm like, you know what? Like, I don't know if I just want to go to school for volleyball. I don't, I, didn't, I don't know if I truly loved it as much as I thought I did. I'm not sure. Did you, did you play competitively in college or anything? Or? Not in college. I ended up not actually, I did the opposite of going all in on volleyball. Instead of going and traveling to play for a club team, I played volleyball and basketball and I like played both of them equally my entire life growing up. So I started when I was like competitively when I was 12 and I played both of them oh. every year. And so it came to my uh, senior year and I was like, do I go all in on volleyball or do I play basketball? And I really wanted to play basketball. Um, so I ended up not yeah. playing, playing college for anything, but um. Gotcha. Played at like the provincial level and stuff here and stuff like and okay. stuff like that. Um, I've actually the kind I've, of similar route that I took. <laughs> yeah, I have. I have one other question, kind of about growing up that I was curious about. I was wondering if you could talk to me about uh, how to have written down here about rearranging the furniture in your home all the time. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, that's a fun. That's a good story. Um, you must have watched some old vlogs and shit. You, I watched a is lot. That, of is that where I mentioned? I can't remember yeah, where. Damn. Yeah. How long? You haven't been following me for that long, have you? No, I think I would have been the first time you would have came across my radar would have been uh, Babin's Twenty Four Hours with. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was like a year ago, or or a little more than a year ago, something like that. Yeah. So I, I guess. Um, I mean, according to my parents, I rearranged the furniture in the house a lot as a young kid because I. I had that design mentality. I had that, or I get that, that, I guess that um, artist mentality where I just love to rearrange certain things. Probably why I'm so obsessed with rearranging my own damn office right now, uh, going down that, that rabbit hole of constantly rearranging. But um, I, think, I think my mom thought I was potentially going to be gay at one point because I, I just, I just, I had that flair, I guess, about me, that flamboyantness, who knows? Um, but I, I think she did mention that to me 
um, which is kind of funny. Because <laughs> your mom's an interior designer, isn't she? Yeah, she is. She's an interior designer. So obviously I got that from my mom and not my dad whatsoever. And you, That's so funny though. And yeah. then when you ended up, you, cause you still, you didn't play volleyball in college, but you did go, I believe you went to Marquette, right? And took design. Yes. So Marquette was the only non-volleyball school I applied. And that was, that was it. Like that was my choice. And I didn't, dude, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know who I was. I was just following the crowd and listening to my parents and not really asking, hey, what is it that I actually want? Um, we had a lot of family that went to Marquette. My parent or my mom is originally from Milwaukee. And my dad is originally from uh, another Northwest suburb of Chicago, uh, but they met together in Milwaukee. So I have a lot of family in Milwaukee and uh, a good amount of them went to, to Marquette. So I'm like, oh, it's a great school. You know, it is a great school. It's a fantastic school. Um, but I, I, it's a funny story if, if you want me to tell it. Of course, I got into the business school of Marquette and just because I, I, I had no interest in business. I just, you know, that seems, that sounds good, right? <laughs> That's pretty much my mindset towards all these things. I don't know if you're resonating with this, but um, yeah. So I got into the business school and then I had broken up with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, she broke up with me <laughs> after a year of dating and, and se senior year of high school. And so I was single and sad and, you know, orientation comes about and there's these two cute girls at that I meet at orientation and they're in biomedical science, a pre-med track that they, they're, they're, um, they, they were in to become dentists and, and Marquette is one of the top schools in dentistry in the, in the world, uh, I believe. And, and I'm like, well, this was when I was starting to get into my fitness stuff. Right. And, uh, I'm like, well, biomedical science, pre-med track, like, you know, I love health, fitness, like that just makes sense. Really, you know, there, here's these two beautiful girls and I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to go and, and follow them and do what they do. So I kind of switch, I switched majors to biomedical science, pre-med track, by the way, ter terrible student. So I had no, no means to, to be doing this, but of course, totally naive and, and clueless. And so I switched to biomedical science and I had bio and chem in my first semester back to back. Um, I had some other classes I can't quite remember, but ended up getting on academic probation, got a 1.6 GPA, I think my first semester. And when you get it below a two, they call you into the dean's office and tell you, hey, you're on academic probation. This is not good. And they, um, they told me if I get below a 2.0 GPA again next semester, that they're going to have to kick me out of school. And so that was my start to my college experience. And obviously, after that, I was crying and like, it was a big fucking mess. And so then my strategy was like, okay, fuck this, right? Uh, I'm going to pick the easiest major I can think of. And so just from what other people told me, I, I came across advertising. So I got into the School of Communications, advertising major, switched into to their second semester, and then I minored in graphic design. And so I had to go to uh, Marquette, didn't have a design school or that, that design, uh, I don't know what it's called, whatever, but I had to go to the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. So I had to take the city bus and, and, and go to that school to take my, my credits for that. And um, and that I loved a lot better. I got a lot of A's in that, in that. I mean, it was easy. I mean, I was terrible. I was a terrible graphic designer. I'm actually a lot better now. Um, and I, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot more now. Um, but back in, in, in school, I was, I was terrible, but it's still a lot easier than a bio or a chemistry. You know what I mean? Yeah. No so, kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned how that was around the time you got into fitness. I know you're watching guys like Matt Ogus, Chris Jones, I believe. Um, yep. And then when you graduate, your plan was to move home and start your own fitness company, right? Yeah, I, I planned on starting my own online training business. 
which is kind of funny because that's like what I'm doing now. And it just didn't, I, I, I started growing it. It was starting to work and I was, I was getting some online clients, but it was mainly just in-person clients. I, I started at a commercial gym and I was working with all these like um, really just wealthy housewives essentially. And I, it, it wasn't, I did not know really what I was getting myself into. It was really, I was just more of like a therapist for these for these women and, and men too. Um, but, but lo- I mean, long story short, I, I, I discovered that I, I wasn't as passionate with the fitness as much as I thought I was. Um, you know, I, I stopped playing volleyball I, I, when, when I got into school. And so the next thing that came about was lifting weights. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. You know, I was a super skinny kid, you know, a little insecure. Let's build up my outer shell so I can get some more confidence and whatnot. So that was kind of the, the inspiration behind it. And I loved lifting weights. It was one of those things. And I still do. I, I still do. Well, I guess not right now because of the shutdowns, but um, it, I absolutely love it. And then when I started working with people, I was like, oh, mm, yeah, I don't really like teaching this. I, I really like just doing it myself. And that's when I also got into the, the YouTube space because I was watching these fitness influencers, the Matt Ogus, the Chris Jones, the Guzmans. Um, and I saw them and I'm like, damn, they just, they got it all. They got the body, they got the girl, they got the car. That sounds really fucking good right now. And as a teenage kid or, you know, 20 year old kid, you know, I can't blame myself for that, you know? So I started getting into the YouTube space for wrong reasons. I started creating for the wrong reasons. Um, and my videos were, were God awful. I mean, just like anybody starting with any skill, they're trash. And a lot of my friends made fun of me too, uh, just because that was back in like 20, like 14 or something. And in Milwaukee, Chicago area, it's not like LA. Like that's very like, what are you doing? Putting yourself on camera. That's still kind of strange uh, back then. Now, even in like the Northwest suburbs of Chicago and these different areas, like it's so popular now. It's so big that you don't just see it in LA and New York anymore. LA, I walk out of my apartment and somebody's got a camera and talking and shit. It's like, it's every day, you know, it's the norm. But back then it was still strange. So I was getting made fun of and people were like, what are you doing? Like, this is stupid. And so I was like, oh yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is so dumb. Um, but, but, but it encouraged me. It, it really, it lit a fire under my ass and um, it, it, it made me want to create better videos, it made me want to create videos where I didn't get made fun of that people looked up to me in those videos and they're like, yeah, you're, you're getting better. And, and, you know, you're doing some cool things here. And so what ended up happening, which is interesting, (laughs) is instead of me becoming the fitness influencer that I wanted to originally, I started getting hired by fitness influencers uh, to film their videos. Um, So that was just kind of a a unique twist on it. Um, But whatever, whatever you believe in, something out there had my back, (laughs) which was great. Um, And so, yeah. And so I started working for, for fitness influencers and um and started making some money and started growing my channel and and it wasn't really until i i guess i kind of skipped a part but it wasn't really until i started creating videos that i truly wanted to create is when i started building an audience like i stopped trying to become somebody else i just created for me created things that really inspired me fulfilled me i found cool sources of inspiration from movies and tv shows and try to insert them into my videos and um you know just had fun with it and made something that i was super proud of that was like the one thing it's like even though i look back at them now and cringe like crazy at the time i looked at them and i'm like i'm really proud of that video and uh, when i made that switch and created rambling road that vlog series um that's when i started seeing a difference with my audience people were like hey man like who's this Zach Kravitz guy? Like I heard he's doing some things like kind of unique things. Um, and, and it's funny, like, I, I, I'm not saying this from like a, uh, like an, uh, self-centered or an egotistical way, but I think I had something to do with the blogging, with the gimbal in the fitness space. Like I saw, I saw maybe, 
I don't know if I'm just like full, full of myself here, but I felt like I saw some trends happening in the fitness vlogging space because of some unique things that I was starting to do. I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> no idea. There, there's a lot of things I want to unpack there. Um, but the first, before we kind of unpack, yeah, oh, sorry, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to, I want to ask you about, which is going to kind of come up again later is when you first started forever in training, when you first started doing that, that was kind of, you thought that was your passion at the time, but despite that, you still took an interview for an administrative assistant at a financial advisor firm. I'm curious why you did that. Mm. I want to make money. I wanted to make money. I was, I was like, I was getting stressed out. I, I, I think I was 22 at the time that I did that or something. I was just so, I, I didn't want to live with my parents. Like, I think that's one of the things when you graduate college, it's like this race to who can move out of their parents' place first, like within groups of friends and stuff. And so I was like, I had, you know, I was comparing myself to like my friend, my friends were getting like really cool jobs. Like I had a buddy of mine that was a uh, computer engineer and like, he got a job right out of college. And like, I think he was making like 50, 60 grand or something like that. And like, for me at the time, I'm like, like, what the, what the fuck am I doing with my life right now? I'm like making like, I'm like making like 10,000 a year or some shit. I don't know what I was making. Uh, but not not sixty grand, that's for sure. And so I, I felt like there was this pressure to do something. And my dad was a financial advisor, so obviously that had uh, that held some weight there, held some value there. And I was like, oh well, you know, I would just kind of hear him talk about certain things, like yeah, like I've got this book of clients, and I don't even have to work, and I get a percentage of their investments, and I make six figures from doing nothing. I'm like, wait, what, wait, what? <laughs> and I wasn't, I didn't really understand it at the time. And it just, again, it just sounded good. And so one of my weaknesses that I'm like starting to discover now is that I get very emotional. Like I, I make decisions based off of emotion a little too quickly. Like I need to like put a pause on it and say like, Hey, like, is this something that I actually want to do? I'm very quick to make like a decision, which can be good but it also can be bad as well. Um, and so I, I just kind of heard those little tidbits, those little stories and whatnot. And I'm like, yeah, I need to make some money. Let's, let's, let's do this job. Let's get this interview. <laughs> and so, so you're sitting in that interview though. And from my understanding, you're kind of sitting there, you're going back and forth with them, but in the back of your head the entire time, you're just going, what am I doing here? And so how did that sitting there in that interview, how did that kind of show you what you actually want to do? Like back to the podcast with Babin last week, he was talking about how when he worked a job he didn't want to, it really showed him doing what he didn't want to do, showed him what he actually wanted to do. So did that interview kind of do the same thing? Yeah. Well, it showed me, it was one of those, uh, um, those, one of those turning points. You, you hear from like entrepreneurs when they like get shit on by a boss or something like that. And they're like, I'm never working for somebody ever again. Like that was the moment. I didn't have like that big moment, but I think that was one of them because as this woman was talking to me, she was just saying things and they were just going over my head. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. Like, what do you want from me? What do you, what do you want me to do here? And, um, I didn't even get the job. I don't know if you knew that, but I, I didn't even get the job in the first place. They were looking for, I think, I mean, yeah, that's so like sexist, but like, it was an administrative assistant job. They were totally looking for like a female. Like they didn't, they didn't want some guy for that position. And like, you know, those firm, it was a very, I like feel like very sexist thing. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I just, it was, it was just that moment where I'm like, I'm never, I, I'm never going to be able to do this. And I also, part of me and the reason why I think I, was so quick to go and start my own thing, start my own business was because I didn't, I didn't really like authority either. I didn't like people telling me what to do. I've always had that. Um, and so that was definitely part of it. And as I started to learn, like, you know, getting bossed around and stuff, I'm like, yeah, I'm not, sorry, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not, I'm not doing what you're telling me to do. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I don't want to talk a ton about 
the fitness YouTube, just because like you said, it was kind of, you realized it wasn't your passion, but I do want to talk about one specific video and it's obviously a transformation video over a million views today. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the transformation specifically, because from my understanding, you had to lose like 40 pounds or something. And when you were at like your lowest, I've heard you say it almost felt like you were, you were walking in water all the time because you just lost so much weight Mm. so fast. So kind of talk to me about, yeah, because it was obviously a very, very, very hard thing to do, but after Mm. coming out the other side, like what did you learn from that whole experience? I learned about myself that if I really want to do something, nothing is going to stand in my way. It was a very empowering moment. I was so laser focused. That, that, that's one of the things that's just super cool about it is that when you start dieting down and you get down to those like low levels, low levels of, of food intake and, and calories, there's a point before it feels like you're walking through chest deep water. There's a point where you're just so dialed in to your goals and the things that you want to do that it's very easy to not get distracted. And it's very easy to say no to the things that you probably shouldn't be doing. Not like having fun and enjoying life, but like, you know, if somebody, I, I, I just, I just wanted to crush my goals. And, you know, before that I was, it was very easy for me to get distracted and just kind of, you know, delay certain things like, Oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. Like I didn't do that. I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it now. Woke up. Like let's, it was like military mode, like get up, get your shit done, then relax and chill and, and do whatever. But then there was that turning point. And that's when I got to like really dangerously low levels of body fat. And that sucked ass. I, I don't want to do that ever again. There's, I mean, the, I've heard, cause I, I just did it like one and done like, ser- like, real low levels of body fat. I did one and done. I've done a cut before, but not that serious. Um, but what I've heard from others is that as you continue to do it, it it does get easier. Um, but that, that, man, that period of of low calories and there, I, I spent, I don't know, maybe like a month in that stage of just waking up and literally feeling like everything is in slow motion. Like you want to move, like I had to literally move my legs because I had, you know, a heavy comforter. I literally had to move my legs out from underneath the comforter to get myself going. It doesn't sound very healthy now that I'm talking about it, but <laughs> that's, that, that's what it was. It's crazy. Advice people give all the time and it's pretty service all advice, but it's just follow your passion. And I'm curious what the lesson is or your takeaway, at least from you, cause you thought you were following your passion for a long time. You thought the fitness thing was your passion and like teaching other people. And so you did what everyone says to do, but you realized that wasn't the right thing. So like, did you have a takeaway? Is there a lesson in that somewhere? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you got to let yourself evolve. You got to let yourself follow, follow those passions. You know what I mean? Like I've worn many, many hats and I wouldn't be here where I am today talking to you if I didn't let myself wear all those hats and experience those things and take little tidbits from each step of the way. Uh, But I was, you know, I was like the sports guy. Then I thought I was the finance guy for a split second. Then I was the fitness guy. Then I was the YouTube filmmaker. Then I was the filmmaker photographer for lifestyle entrepreneurs. Now I'm the creative coach. Like you got to let yourself evolve. Um, you, You have to let yourself make the wrong decision man that's like that's the biggest thing you know i think people are so quick to not step into something because they're afraid it's it's the wrong decision let it be wrong like you know we're like at the time of me doing these things i was like it feels like uh like the world's going to be over like your life at 20 it's like oh my life's over at 20 years old because i made the wrong decision and then when you get older i'm 28 now and you look back and you're just like dude you're an idiot you don't know anything and i'm sure at 38 i'll be saying the same thing about myself right now i'll probably listen to this interview and be like oh my god you are so dumb (laughs) you know what i mean so you gotta you have to let yourself evolve there's one other thing I was going to say. What, what was the question again? The question was, was there any lesson in following your passion and then it turning out to be the wrong thing? Oh, yeah. So I think one little tidbit to add to that, I think is, yeah. So, so let yourself follow those passions. 
but then there has to be, there, there's a switch that's being made, right? And that is, does it fulfill you and does it lead into something bigger, a bigger mission than yourself? Because a passion, a pa- I, I think... I was going to make a podcast episode about this. I still haven't yet. I haven't wrote kind of the outline yet. So this is kind of some rough ideas, but I think it depends how you define passion. I, a lot of people have different definitions for it. So what I'm about to say, you, you might not agree with me, but that's okay. Um, I, I look at passion as kind of like that. Um, um, what's the, what's, what's it called when you get into a relationship for the first time, the, the honeymoon stage. It's kind of like the honeymoon stage where you're just, you're so just into it. You love it. And I think it's one of those things where it comes and goes, but you can't rely on it. It has to turn into purpose at some point in time. If you want that long-term fuel, you know what I mean? When you have purpose, you've got fulfillment, you've got joy. It's bigger than yourself. It's a bigger mission. It's about the people that you're serving you know, passion is just, it's just one little tiny slice of the pie. I think it's something that maybe it, 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 it blossoms into a potential purpose. Um, but just passion alone, you, you need more than that. So. And so I'm curious what you think would have happened just like career-wise for you if those fitness videos had started hitting early on consistently, like you started to become a fitness influencer. Ooh. Do you think you would have carried on down that path even if you realized it was the wrong thing? That's a great fucking question. Um, man, you're good at this. Thank you. Um, you, you know what you remind me of? You remind me of, um, what's that hot wing show? Sean Evans. Yeah. 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 You were, you were Sean you. Evans. 1000 billion percent. I don't know if that's what you're going for, but, but yeah, you're Sean, Ev- you're Sean Evans point version 2.0. Thank you. I've, I've got, <laughs> it's not necessarily what I intended to go for, but it's starting to come yeah. up on a regular basis. So I think it's just where yeah. I'm at. Yeah. Cause you ask questions that nobody, like when I watch those interviews that they have the same reaction as I do. I'm like, how the, how the fuck did you know that? Like, what, like, what are you watching? You know, you really take the time. And, um, I think that's a really powerful way to differentiate, di- differentiate, uh, between, or differentiate yourself from other podcasts, but thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so wait, I'm sorry. I, I lost my, my train of thought. That's the, why, if, if, if fitness stuck, mm-hmm. would I can, would I continue down that path? Like if I got a million subscribers because of, of fitness, um, mm. mm-hmm. 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 I think it would have stuck a lot longer. I think it would have, I think I started that, you know, I did that in 20, started in like 2014, 2015, 2016. It, maybe it would have ended in like 2017, 2018. I think I would have used my fitness influence and following and then turn it into something different, make it evolve in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would, I think I would have done, I think I would have done something different or it it would have evolved into something else i know what i'm doing right now is going to evolve into something else i know i'm not going to be just a creative coach and then put a period on it i i mean just to talk about goals for a second like you know my coaching program like the creator's blueprint you know i'm trying to turn that into a multiple seven figure business like i'm trying to turn that into something that bit that is big that makes an impact And then I want to have it allow me to do something else and, and, and go into something different. You know, I want to get into real estate at some point in time and, 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 and play around in in that world and create more revenue streams from, from that. So um, yeah, I think I would have done it for sure, but it would have evolved into something else, just like what I'm doing right now is going to evolve into something else. So that's a good question. That stumped me for a second. Thank you. Um, and then, so yeah. eventually though, you end up pivoting, you end up going into more of the filmmaking, filmmaking route. And I'm mm-hmm. curious. So with that being in mind, I want to talk about your first paid gig. Cause from my understanding, you took it on 24 hours notice with a broken thumb. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. That was hilarious. Um, I don't know if that was my first paid gig. Technically. I think my first paid gig was just some, like I did something for a friend for like a couple hundred bucks. I kind of forgot about that. Um, but I guess my legitimate 
first time gig was a wedding film. And I was still super into fitness and I was trying to get the 600 pound deadlift <laughs> and, uh, and I almost got it. I just was just about to lock it out. Couldn't do it. Couldn't quite lock it out for, for a gym pers- PR personal record. Uh, I, I would have counted it, but in like a powerlifting meet, that would have been no bueno. So I don't know if you can really count that. I just tell people, yeah, I've done 600 pounds because it makes me feel better. But, um, yeah, and then as the bar went down, I don't know what the fuck happened, but the shock wave of the bar, because it's a lot of weight, and I had, you know, that's why powerlifters use those really thin plates so it doesn't create so much whip in certain organizations in, in powerlifting, um, and, and they don't want that, that whippiness because that whippiness, when I, when I dropped it, I dropped it too low to the ground, and so the bar popped back up, popped me in the thumb, and I, and I broke it and I thought I had dislocated it. it there was no pain. There's no nothing, but I literally couldn't move my thumb. So I'm like, oh yeah, no big deal. Um, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the, the hospital and they'll pop it right back in. And they did an x-ray and they're like, dude, your shit is snapped, snapped. And I, I was stunned and they were stunned because I had no pain. They said that, sh- that's, that, that should really hurt, dude. Um, but I, I must have been in just extreme shock. But anyways, um I I got surgery and and had it in a a cast. And then one of my buddies who's a talented wedding photographer saw that I was doing stuff on YouTube. You know, I was that at that point in time, I was really branding myself as a filmmaker at that point in time. And um, and he's like, hey man, like this wedding videographer just bailed on my wedding couple. Do you want to film this wedding? And I'm like, my first gut feeling, like, I was like, absolutely not. Like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a fraud. I'm an imposter. Um, I just make silly YouTube videos. Like all those thoughts of, of like negative self-doubt just creeps in right away. And um, I don't know who it was. It might have been my mom. Somebody told me, they're like, you're doing that fucking wedding. <laughs> Like, okay, I'll do it. Uh, somebody encouraged me. I, I think, I think it was my mom. Um, she really helped me out there. Thanks mom. Um, and so I didn't have a gimbal. All I had was a monopod and my Sony a seven S two at the time. And I went out to Best Buy and got a 24 to 70 lens. And I think I ended up returning it the next day, which really like, something you shouldn't do but you know whatever um i was a kid at the time and um and i filmed this fucking wedding man and let me tell you i crushed it and that was that was really the start of my filmmaking career um because i did a wedding without even realizing it for this family from lake forest that had a lot of money and they had a lot of friends that also had a lot of money and a lot of people were getting married in the, in those circles so I just started getting re- referrals like crazy. Um, and I, and I started doing weddings and that was, that was a big, uh, turning point for me because even though I found out it wasn't something I enjoyed, I actually, I absolutely hated it. It was not fun. In the beginning it was okay. And then I'm like, okay, this is, this is terrible. Um, but it did pay a lot and it gave me the freedom to work on those other passion projects and to, um, start continue continue to build my my personal brand um so yeah but i did it with a broken thumb but it turned out really well so i guess the moral of the story for that is just just do it yeah just you gotta just dive into it go for it as cliche as that sounds and i want to talk about those passion projects i want to talk about rambling road because those are some of the prettiest vlogs i think on youtube and from my understanding, one of your inspirations for those videos, you said how you like to incorporate shots for movies into them, the cinematic type shots, but the, the impetus for that was Seinfeld, right? A show about nothing. And you wanted to just make a vlog about nothing, right? Like, how do you go about doing that? Cause that's something like I, whenever I vlog, it's for like a month and I get super into it. And then I'm like, my life, nothing happens. How do I keep doing that? It's like, how do you find a story out of nothing? Yeah. Um, oh man, I, I haven't really thought about this in, in a long time, but um I you would hear that all the time from vloggers that like, oh, I can't vlog. Um, you know, my life is so boring. And I'm like, fuck that. Like, 
I'm going to, that, that I like challenged myself, you know, and I, I love Seinfeld and, and just, you know, I knew that the, <laughs> I knew if they, if they could do it, like, like, why can't I just bring that element onto YouTube? Like that, that was the whole motto of it was like, you know, all this stuff is on TV. It's kind of like how, you know, TV got so big, right? It, you know, movies, movies was the thing, right? And then television became popular because it got so good. And I'm like, let's bring this to YouTube. Like, let's, let's make these Netflix type series and, um, and, and make it feel like quality television. Like, like bring it to YouTube, just like, t just like TV brought it for movies. So that was kind of the theme. And then the way I would go about filming, it was, br it was, it was really, it was difficult. So I would, I didn't post that much. I think I posted maybe once a week. That was kind of like my blog upload schedule at, at best once, once a week, maybe I throw in a couple videos occasionally. Um, but, um, I would, I would film my whole week and then I would piece it together as one cohesive story and pretend like it was just a one day situation. And, um, and I would find something like a theme throughout the day that I thought would just be funny and, and just, just be a good story. Like, you know, my dad and I got drunk one day and we had to fix my car and we were buzzed from, you know, drinking and we were trying to fix my car buzz. Like that's a story, right? So let's turn that into something. <laughs> You know, little things like that, just little elements throughout the day where I'm like, okay, that, that could be an interesting story. And so I was always just not in the present moment because of it. I was living and, and treating myself as a character. And like, <laughs> I heard this statement, it was like, uh, what, 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 it was, um, you know, what's, what's, what's bad for life is good for YouTube. What's, what's good for life is, is bad for YouTube. It's not entertaining. So anything that bad happened in my life, I'm like, bam, I got an episode. Let's go. I think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of popular bloggers kind of have that mentality of like, what's bad for life is probably a good video, good content, but it's kind of dangerous. Uh, I didn't take it to that dangerous level, but um, I, I was not in the present moment. I think that's the big problem with blogs. And that's why you don't see me put out as much content anymore. Um, on the YouTube channels because I got so burnt out from not being in the present moment. And, um, and that kind of took me down another path. Um, so yeah, and, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. And is part of that burnout too, like always adding pressure to yourself of like, when am I going to blow up? Like, when is my moment going to come? And like every video you're just hoping for like it to explode. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would receive that comment all the time. I still get that comment and I haven't even posted a video in like three months or something. They're like, Oh dude, like I haven't seen this guy. This guy's going to blow up. I'm like, dude, I haven't even posted a video, man. <laughs> like, so I, I would, I would receive that comment all the time. And in the beginning it was amazing, right? Like when you receive that and you're trying to become a YouTuber, cause that's who I was trying to become. That was my life. I'm like, I'm going to be a YouTuber deep down. I don't think I really wanted to be a YouTuber. I think deep down I wanted to um, just be like a visionary, like a director. You know, I wanted to create really cool st stuff and impact people, but I, I never wanted to be a YouTuber. Like, you know, that new guy, Eric, um, yeah. that YouTuber, Eric or whatever, like he is a YouTuber. That man is designed for YouTube and to play the algorithm and to, to create these unbelievable videos. Um, I, I'm not like that guy. I, you know, I, I guess you could, maybe I was more of like a Matt Diavella type of person where it was like, you know, creating more short film storytelling like that. And um, I think I just, you know, got burnt out and, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to, give myself an excuse, but, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Uh, what I was doing was putting too much weight and value into those comments. And so because of that, when I would receive positivity and, and, um, and engagement and thumbs up, like it was a great day. But when I didn't get that, 
it was a terrible day. So I was putting way too much of my self-worth into my own audience. I think some of that can be good because it turned me into the video creator that I am today. It gave me the confidence to turn into the video creator that I am today because everyone was like, dude, you're so talented. You're so good. You know, um, I, I think a little bit of that is, is okay to get the momentum going, to have that confidence to, you know, call yourself and brand yourself that I think it helps for sure. But you got to, again, make that switch where you don't put so much value into those comments. And that's kind of where I'm at now. I've almost detached myself from my own shit that I put out there. I put it out there because I felt really passionate about it. I felt good. Um, it, 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 um, it came from a place of inspiration. But then as soon as I posted it, that's it. It's done. Like, stop looking at all the engagement. The kind of, That shit does not matter. I'll look at it from an objective point of view. Like, if something's not registering I'm, to people, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's totally fine. I know people needed to be impacted by that. I felt good about it. Um, but maybe, maybe I could maybe switch something up to, to get it out there a little bit more. I do have those thoughts for sure. Um, but like if somebody says like, you're bald, you're fat, like that, that does nothing to me. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't put value into the comments like that. Anymore. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah. And you mentioned how you essentially just made that switch. And there's another switch that you made that I want to ask you about. And I have a quote here specifically, and it says, the quote is when I decided to become a full-time creator. Yes, a choice, not a waiting game. So talk to me about that, where you made the switch and you're like, I'm now a full-time creator. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So my point in saying that is everybody has the power to declare that. Everybody has all of the, the tools, the resources that they need to become that successful person. But the key is, is you have to be that person now. You can't just expect experiences to turn you into that person. You need to become that person then to gain those experiences. Because if you're in the mindset of somebody that, may, that makes a million dollars, for example, as a creative, you're going to make decisions from that place. That's the key thing. If you're making decisions from a place of, I want to make $10,000 for the year, you're going to be sitting on your ass. You're going to be um, you know, hiding in your shell, you know, you're going to only work for somebody that just wants you to put a little gym at it as a swipe up story on Instagram. You're not going to make some powerful piece or whatever. You, you know what I mean? So we have those, those tools to make those decisions right now and growing in general. And this is kind of, I'm going through this more now than I ever, ever have. Like last year was such a growth period. Like for my business, it was the best year financially, but it was the hardest year mentally. It really took a toll on me. I had to really dig deep and go through some shit. And I really learned that growing our, our brains, we, we want to stay comfortable. And even if we think we're kind of suffering, it's really not suffering if you're really not making those changes because pain is the biggest motivator, more so than the glory. Like, if, if the glory of it and just wanting something was, a, was the biggest motivator, we would all have our G-Wagons and Lambos and, you know, part beautiful relationship. We, we'd have it all, right? Whatever it is that you want. Um, but it's not because it's not the biggest motivator. Pain is. And that's why I see people that hit rock bottom. They catapult and do some just amazing things that they didn't think was possible probably. And it wasn't, and it didn't happen, or it did happen only because of, of that rock bottom. Um, so, yeah, growing, growing. I, I don't know where where I was going with that, but growing is is it's not easy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's tough. And that that's an interesting point. That's something I've never considered before. That pain is the bigger motivator than just wanting the success. That's probably something I'm going to think about mm -hmm. for the next couple of days here, but. I want to ask you about, can you talk to me about the story of starting in 2017, there's a tweet that ultimately ended up changing the trajectory of your career. Can you kind of tell me that whole story? Which tweet? From Lewis House. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what, is, what tweet? I'm, I'm on Twitter. I haven't tweeted in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that really did change things for me. That's when I started to not just work for fitness influencers 
fitness influencers and weddings anymore. I started really working for people that were doing big things. So um, he kind of took a chance on me, but I also had to prove it at the same time. I had just gotten back from New York. So keep in mind, this was a period of time where I think I was making, I think I was making like close to like 80 grand, something like that at that point in time. So I was doing well. I was living with my parents. I had no bills. I was just pulling in profit. You know what I mean? Like I was like big money, man, like, <laughs> like feeling really good about myself. And so I'm going to New York and I'm just, I'm spending money. <laughs> and it, it, I guess I shouldn't say that I, I was collaborating with people and, and I was doing the whole YouTube thing. So I just gotten back from New York and that tweet, he needed a, a content creator videographer that was local in New York city, uh, to follow him around for a book tour. And so I don't, um, I think somebody tagged me in the tweet, a buddy of mine tagged me in the tweet and, um, and I reached out to him really short conversation. I wasn't expecting anything. And he, um, he reached back out within like four hours or something like that. And was like, yo, like, show me your work, you know, like short, like little responses, like that guy has zero time for any kind of conversation. Um, so I, I showed him my work and stuff and I told him, um, you know, I'm not from New York. I gotta be honest. I, I wasn't going to lie to him. I'm not from New York. Um, and he's like, well, I really need someone from New York. Like I, I, I can't have somebody flying out and blah, blah, blah for whatever reason. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Here's what we'll do. I'll fly out to New York on my own dime. I'll put myself up. You don't have to worry about it. Just give me the position and I'll be there. Don't worry. And he's like, okay, like you got a deal. I mean, very quick uh, after I showed him my work, of course. And um, I had to talk to um, a, a producer of his because this was, this was for his book tour, but then it was also for a documentary that he was putting together that he was trying to get onto Netflix at the time. Um, so I had to talk to his producer and kind of prove that I knew what the fuck I was talking about. And it's funny because all those little projects of vlogging and, um, and working for those influencers like that, all that experience led me up to this point, being able to take this job. And I was nervous as hell. Don't get me wrong. Cause this was the biggest, um, client that I had at the time. Um, but it was a walk in the park because that's what I had done for I don't know, maybe two years at the time. Like that's, that's what I was good at. It was putting together something out of nothing. And that's what happened. Cause I was following him around. I was getting B roll. It was mainly for the B roll for the documentary. But of course I had had an inkling that he wanted me to create something out of that footage for his brand. And so that's what I did and created this little piece that he absolutely loved. And I provided a lot of value for him. Did it for free. Didn't, uh, didn't get paid, paid a dime. Um, just wanted the opportunity. And, and from there on out, he really kind of taught me um, how to network, how to make connections, how to provide value to people. And I started thinking of myself as more than just a guy that creates epic content or whatever the hell you want to call it. I started um, creating content that had more purpose for people that solved a problem for people that got more engagement for them. I started speaking that business language. Um, and then obviously uh, working through him, he's got one of the biggest networks out there. I was able to charge a premium to his network and he would refer me to people. And that's when, that's when things really changed. I started working for, for some really cool, dope people. So, yeah. At, so, yep, yep. so you do that trip, I believe it was 10 days up and down New York. You're working for free. And at the end of the trip, Lewis, Lewis actually offered you a job, but you turned it down to do your own thing. I was wondering if you could walk me through that decision as to why you said no. Yeah. Um, again, kind of like what we talked about before. I just knew, I knew that I would not have been happy. Um, I, I knew that the, I, I had enough experience under my belt at that point in time that um it, i i just i never want to work for someone i just i had just such a gut burning desire to have something for myself um and it wasn't shortly after that 
I, that's when I started to get burnt out with the client work. And that's when I wanted to make that transition to more of a creative coach than just, um, a filmmaker photographer that wanted to do client work all the time. You know, I was, I was gone every single month. Um, and you know, I, I, nothing against Lewis. I just, there's just, I, I didn't want to be an employee. I didn't want to be just stuck to one environment. I had a message out of voice. I knew I could help people with the experiences that I had at the time. Um, and I'm glad I didn't because it obviously it, it paid off. Um, so yeah, it was just another, that, that decision was actually really easy for me to make because I had enough experience at that time. And the desire, that burning desire at that point was large enough to say, to say no and, and keep going down the path. I think it's very similar to business owners that, or, or even artists like in the music industry that, um, they get like offers from labels and certain things that they, they take a chunk and they'll take a percentage from them to, you know, produce music for them. I, that, feels like a very similar decision where it's like it's short-term gain but but i was thinking long big picture maybe that would have played a small role because i i could leave it's not like you're signing like a 10-year contract or a five-year contract like these artists and these music in, in the music industry and whatnot but um yeah i was i was just thinking big picture you know lewis was also the reason you moved out right yeah yeah, he, oh yeah, I remember that too. So <laughs> it's all coming back. Um, yeah, after, after that, um, after we got done for 10 days together in New York, which was crazy, I, I got really sick. Like I was so stressed out just from like working with him, being nervous. I didn't, also, I didn't know really what I was doing until the day I got there. Like there was very little communication. They're like, just show up, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay. And I, you know, from there on out, and, and we were also meeting some big time people too. Um, we were, we were, we were having meetings and things. I was meeting people like, like, <laughs> I don't know. Do you know Gabby Bernstein at all? I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, she's like huge in the personal development space. I didn't know who she was. Like there were some people that like, I had no clue who these people were like, whatever. And then, and then when I got back and told stories like, yeah, I did work with, you know, Gabby Bernstein or, you know, met this person from Cadillac and like, they're the creative director of Cadillac. Like all these like different cool people are like, what the hell, man? Um, so my, <laughs> my point in saying that is I, I was, I was meeting up with very high end people that I had never had that experience with. So I was, it was very nerve wracking because I, I was just in environments that I had never been in before. So I got sick and uh, it was just crazy, crazy long 10 days. We were, we were walking back and forth, you know, the hustle and bustle of New York. Like you're walking everywhere, getting into taxis. We were on good morning America. Like we were going all over, boom, boom, boom. Um, and so finally, after the 10 days, uh, we flew back to Chicago. That was the last stop was Chicago. And, um, and I got dropped off because I was still living in Chicago and he did his little thing in Chicago and then moved or, or took a flight back out to LA. But we were sitting on the airport floor together because I was dumping footage and giving it to him on a little hard drive for him to take to his um, editors of that documentary that they were putting together. And I just asked him, I'm just like, cause I was just so, I didn't know what to do. Um, again, I'm making, you know, making like, like 70, I forgot how much, I think I made like 80 grand at that point in time or something like that. I was getting to six figures, but I, I was so stuck. I didn't know what to do with myself. And so I'm like, Hey, what, what should I do to get to that next level? Like such a generic, basic ass question. And he's like, you need to move out of your parents ASAP. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. Like I, it was one of those things where like you knew deep down what you had to do, but you were trying to stay comfortable and in your zone and, and not branch out and do something scary. And I knew that deep down, but hearing it from a guy like that, who was at that level, um, that just kind of struck a chord with me. And it, it was really a slap in the face in a good way. A uh, nice little wake up call. And so I think like two weeks later, found an apartment in Chicago, moved out and um, 
And I've been trying to make myself uncomfortable ever since because it just kept getting me to the next level. And so speaking of making yourself uncomfortable, you, when you got that apartment, you made sure the apartment was more than you could afford at the time to create that uncomfortable feeling to force yourself to get more clients and make more money. But so that's already kind of adversity in its own right, right when you move out. But month one, January, 2018, I believe your hard drive, your hard drive corrupts, you lose tons of footage. And I don't think you booked a single client that month, January 31st. How are you feeling with the decision that you've made? Yeah, I think I think I had like six months saved up of like rent and like bills and stuff like that. Um, you know, but yeah, I got I got an apartment that really scared the shit out of me that I I had to grow into. And uh it's really it's one of those things that I think your lot the logical person would have been like, You're an idiot, like what are you doing? You know, I was also a little naive at that point in time, and I think that also is a huge factor that helps not to stay naive forever, but it helps get the ball going, you know? So I got something that I could really grow into. <laughs> and even Lewis, like he saw my apartment. He's like, Oh shit. You like, kind of took what I said really seriously. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm doing what you're telling me to do here. Um, <laughs> but it's all, it was also, I mean, it, it was in an area like I wasn't in like the hottest area of Chicago, but it was a, it was a dope apartment, man. Like that place was so cool. It was an old Otis elevator factory that got refurbished into an apartment building. And, and, and then shortly after I moved in, then my girlfriend at the time moved in, I think like six or seven months later, um, and we and she hated it. Like like we we ended up like not liking it. It was very dark, and like there was dust everywhere, and I was sneezing all the time. And I just got caught up in the fact that it was like this beautiful loft, and uh, it was just cool. Like I just loved. It. I felt really inspired. But there were some things that we didn't like about it. But anyways, um, um, I'm sorry, I got lost again. That's what, a, what was the question? I was just asking about making the decision to move out and then have like all these things go wrong where you don't book a client, your hard drive corrupts and you lose tons of footage. And oh, like at the end of the month, how are you feeling? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, that, that was insane. So I got, so as I, as I got into the apartment, I moved in. Like, I feel like that was the one thing that I didn't enjoy was when you do move into your first apartment or a new apartment, like that should be a really enjoyable experience be a lot of fun like you should be grateful you should be excited and yeah a little nervous or whatever but like you said um my my hard drive corrupted i had 20 terabytes on there and it corrupted and i was just again ignorant at the time didn't have a proper backup um <laughs> you know little things you learn throughout the journey right <laughs> always have a backup luckily i only had one active client on there the rest of it was just my my YouTube blog stuff was, which still kind of stung because those were some cool moments on there that would have been nice to have, especially when, you know, like certain family members and parents pass away. Like I, I would have really enjoyed those moments. Luckily they're on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I lost that footage, freaking out, had an active client on there, had to reshoot some of the project and she, she was not happy with me. Um, so I had never had a negative experience with a client before. So that was my first time having to experience that again, growing, right. Growing is not easy. You got to experience these things. Um, and then my bathroom exploded. Right. I, I don't know if you've heard that story, but, mm -hmm. um, I was sitting in my office. It was a two bedroom, one bath. I had my own office. So cool. Sitting in my office and smelled this, uh, smell fecal matter <laughs> i smelled shit <laughs> like what is that smell like that's nasty and i'm wearing these like ugg slippers these fluffy ugg slippers you know and uh i stepped away from my desk and took three steps splat and i looked down and there's this muddy murky looking water that created this little path because the floors were not perfectly even so it created this little, it was like this little nice flowing river of, sh of poop and, and pee. And, um, and I'm like, oh my God. And I, and I ran to the bathroom 
that's where it was leading. And I go in there and the shower, the drain, it was literally a water fountain of poo and pee water coming, just shooting out of it like a rocket. And I'm like, this is, I are you like this is this cannot be real. This is a movie scene right now. And so obviously my first um <laughs> reaction was to go grab my camera and start filming this stuff. And I actually have a vlog on it. Um if anybody listening wants to go check it out, but it's of the aftermath. It, it wasn't of the shooting water explosion, unfortunately. I was not fast enough to capture that. Um Yeah, and so yeah, I mean there's really no point in telling that story other than just everything felt like it was falling apart. It was the wrong decision. You know, I had that feeling of, uh, I had this real feeling of, um, um, uh, what's the word of, uh, I can't think of the word right now, but just this pushback, right? Like I made all these wrong decisions and that feeling of wanting to throw in the towel and just like give up and stop. And then that's when I got that phone call and, and booked my first 10 K client. That was my first five figure client that I booked. And, uh, it, it was just like, you gotta be, you gotta be fucking kidding me right now. <laughs> but the moral of the story, it's like, there's so many times along our journey where we just want to toss in the towel. Like I, I had one, I had one, you know, just pretty like recently, so semi recently last year, I'm just like, I'm done. Like you, you just have the, and, and it, you can look at somebody's life and be like, Oh, everything's great. And it, looking at my own life, I'm like, everything's great, but you still have just these certain things that can happen that just trigger you. And like, and you just want to toss in the towel and just stop. But I didn't, I just kept like, I just, I'm like, I'll just figure this out. Like, it's fine. And sure enough, you get that phone call. And that was like that, that answer that I needed because I was doing all the right things. It just didn't feel like it at that point in time. It felt like everything was just, a, it was just over, you know? So. Yeah. No, I think sometimes when like I have those moments, I try to envision myself like writing my autobiography in like 45, 50 years and being like, the story would be so shitty if it just ends with me quitting at this point. Like, I think the story will be so much yeah. better if I just push through. Um, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like people want the secret sauce, you know, that's, I'm always getting asked, yo, what's, yo, <laughs> what's the secret sauce. But um, there's so many people and I haven't been in business this long, but from what, what I hear about my mentors and things that people that I've been able to talk to, that have been in business for like 30 years. It's like they, all they say is just don't stop. You will figure it out. You will figure it out. And there's things you can do to get there faster that are important, but do not stop because there's people that make money and then they, they just disappear because it got too hard or whatever. And, and uh, yeah, there, it's just interesting, like certain trends and things they come in and, and go and just like people in business, they just, they just stop. And all you have to do is just not stop and you're going to, you're going to get where you want to go. And it's going to be a, uh, a very rewarding process. And also one thing too, in terms of like your journey, obviously you're not in Chicago anymore. You're in LA and it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but you ended up moving to LA like six, seven months after you moved out into your first apartment. So you had to, so it's kind of a two prong yeah. question, why LA? And then with you moving out before the end of your lease, you had to kind of like buy yourself out of the rest of your lease. So you're paying like a ton of money yeah. to move out. So why LA and why did it have to be right away? Why couldn't you wait? Um, opportunity cost, opportunity cost. You know, I, I was really starting to meet some cool people at this time. And I had some really good voices in my ear, um, kind of mentoring me and like asking me really good questions. Right. Cause you're never going to get a good answer unless you ask a really good question. Um, and like someone proposed the question, like just as an example, you know, do you want to not pay six grand right now? or seven grand or whatever it was, um, and just kind of wait and delay the inevitable? Or do you want to go now and make 50 grand and think of six grand as nothing and get that now? So that was kind of the question, if that makes sense. I don't know if I said that properly, but 
those were kind of the thoughts that I was thinking, like, do I want the life that I want right now? Or do I just want to wait and delay to save a little bit of money that, you know, a year from now or eight months from now, I'm going to think is, is not that much money. So that, those were the questions I was asking myself. And that's a real thing. So I, I did, I, I, I cut my lease, paid up the penalty of like three to four times the rent or some shit. I couldn't get a, um, couldn't get a tenant or find somebody to sublease. And so I just, I just paid that and also had bills racking up. And that was like a time where financially I was just like, oh man. Uh, this is this is kind of hurting right now, <laughs> and uh, it was it was kind of stressful. But I just I trusted myself that I was going to figure it out and and do the right thing. And obviously, it ended up working out. Um, and so I knew L.A. To answer your question about L.A., um, I was still doing film work at the time, and I was traveling to L.A. quite a bit, and that I knew that. I had to move there because my clients were a lot of my clients were there, but then also the people that I wanted to become were there. And as you know, proximity is power and you can build, you build that circle, you, you build that, that network of people. And if you continue hanging with those people, man, you're going to, you're going to grow so much faster. And so that was, that was the vision that I had was, you know, I'm just going to get there and, I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to feel the heat and I'm going to persevere and, and get through it and, and, and learn how to create the life that I actually want to live and not just a burnt out filmmaker that just did client work and felt stuck in this hamster wheel, you know? And so when you get to LA, that's when you start working with some of these rappers like uh, g Push Pusha T, Vic Mensa. You're starting to do all those things you set out to do. You're getting those bigger clients. But it's around that time that you start to realize that this really isn't what you want to do. Is that kind of a mind fuck for you where things are starting to go so well, but you're like, I just don't want to do this at all? Yeah. Yeah. Because I was working, I was doing some cool things and I was, I was around cool people. I was in circles with cool people, you know, Pusha T, for example. Um, you know, I knew his, um, his, uh, touring photographer and they needed a video done. And so I'm sitting in push T's dressing room. Like one day I wasn't one day I'm, I'm, I'm sitting next to this guy that I'd listened to in high school. You know, it's just a very like surreal moment where you're like, where the fuck am I right now? And why <laughs> these people are looking at me like, why the fuck is this guy here right now? <laughs> Not really, but I was just making up shit in my head. <laughs> but I, I was doing some really cool stuff and, and that was awesome. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like, it just looks cool. You know, if it doesn't fulfill you and, and you know, you have something else that's burning in you that you want to be doing, like, it doesn't really matter. You know, people do a lot of stuff for cloud and all that. Um, you know, that's not why I was there. I was, I was there because I wanted to create a business, but, and, and network, but, um, that is, that's another story. Um, so, so yeah, it was hard to let go, you know, 2019, that was the year that I'm like, screw it. I'm not going to take a single client and I'm going to challenge myself to create this online coaching business and help creatives get through what I was getting through. And I'm not gonna lie, I started it for selfish reason. You know, I think I think a lot of people start businesses for selfish reasons. You know, most people. Why, why do most people want to start a business? They want it, it's about them. They have. I have a message. I want to get my voice out there. I want to grow an audience. I want to make money. I want more freedom. Right? Like those are the things that you're saying. And so I was saying all those things, but I had to, uh, in, in in order to not be one, that person that just quits and tosses in the towel. You have to make it bigger than you. And so when I started speaking to other creatives and start working with these people and start seeing some of the results that I was actually able to give them um, and, and just getting, receiving that feedback of like, hey man, like this really, this saved my life or this helped, helped me, this tripled my income or whatever. 
it becomes a lot more real than just a YouTube comment or a DM or whatever, when you're talking to people face to face, like we are right now, even though it's virtual. Um, so it started to become a lot bigger than just me and, uh, and people depended on me. That's, that's kind of at the end of the day, I felt like this, this business is it, like it, it, I need to continue because people are depending on information and guidance and accountability and community and all these different things. Um, so in 2019, like I, I started launching the, the, some, some courses and some digital products towards the end of 2018 and I actually made more money than my biggest client at the time that I started. And I'm like, wait a second, like my first launch, I'm like making more money as my biggest client. Like, okay, that gave me some confidence. I'm like, okay, maybe I can do this. So I didn't just go into 2019 blind. I had just a little sign. I'm like, huh, maybe I, maybe I could do this. And so um, I'm a big believer in focusing all of your energy on, on really one thing that you want to grow and blossom. Um, and so I took that very seriously in 2019. I'm like, okay, client work, it's getting in the way of this right now. So let's fucking go in and it paid off. So, and you, yeah. you didn't just stop client work either. You kind of stopped pretty much everything, right? Like content creation slowed down for you. I know you're working on a backpack company, Wayland for a while, like you kind of paused that and you were just like singular focus on the courses, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that it, it, it also became overwhelming too, because now I've got all these members, right? And then it was like, oh man, I got, I got members. I got to create content now. I still felt like I was in the same kind of hamster wheel that I had just left. I'm like, oh my God, here we go again. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, oh shit, I forgot what, <laughs> what, what you said. What was the question? Sorry, man. My, my, my question uh, was just around. almost like five times. <laughs> That's okay. My question was around kind of not just stopping clients, but stopping everything and focusing on just the courses and like how that positively impacted your business. Because I think for different people, like some people can't just focus on one thing. They feel like they have to be doing a million things, but I wanted to like, oh, yeah. explain how yeah. this positively impacted your business. Yeah. So it's, it's really hard because you feel like you're letting certain things go that your life depended on. You know, I was letting go of, of an identity because I was this YouTuber, right? Um, but it was getting in the way of the life that I wanted to live. And that's way more important than just like some clout or some, you know, you know, I know I can always come back to it. I know that I can always start something again and do that. I just, I had to just put that on pause because I knew deep down and also from the people that I surrounded myself with, I knew that if I really wanted to build this business, I, I had to give myself the time to do that. I, you know, you got to take a step backward or two to, to really slingshot yourself to the destination that you're looking to go. And so now, you know, as, because I did that, I went through that building stage. Now I'm starting to break out of that building stage. And because of that, more freedom. Now I've got, more time to start things like a podcast and create episodes and do these podcasts with you and, and then start YouTube again, if I want to. Um, and then with the, the backpack business, you know, that was really hard for me and it still is because that's such a passion project that like I know is going to be still part of my life. It's just going to be a different chapter right now. I had to put that on pause, but the reason why I didn't do that was because I was trying to grow two businesses at the same time when I hadn't even really gr created one in the first place, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so I had, I really had to put that on pause and be like, you know, just grow, just grow this business that we've got this whole life ahead of us. Just grow the thing in front of you right now. You still love it, do it. Um, and let it give you the freedom to do other things then later in life or you know, a few years later, it doesn't have to be that far, but you know, yeah. And so one of the things you said that Lewis told you back in 2017 was to just make yourself uncomfortable. And as things now today in 2020 continue to grow and scale, it's probably going to be easy to get comfortable with the success you're having. So what are you doing today? That's still forcing yourself to get out of your comfort zone. That's a good question. Um, 
what am I doing today to get myself uncomfortable? I'm still making investments. I'm still putting myself in places that, um, that I know is going to help me grow. Um, but just, it, it, it just, it scares me. Um, you know, education, um, I'm constantly educating myself and, and, and spending, spending my money on things that aren't necessarily tangible, like, like a mastermind or something. When you, when you have all these creatives or entrepreneurs that come together and are trying to grow together, it's very, very powerful, but at the same, and you're learning so much, but at the same time, it's not like super tangible, you know? That's why most creatives buy a camera and they don't buy education on how to get more clients or, or run a business. You know what I mean? They, they always go to the gear and stuff because it's more, in my opinion, it's more tangible because they're really getting something that they can hold and use. And it's really fun. Let's be honest here. It's, it's pretty fun to buy new gear and shit. Um, and so I'm trying to do the opposite of that. I'm trying to, to invest in, and do things like, like employees, like another thing that's just not super tangible, but you are buying your time back and your time is one of the most important resources. It is the most important resource ever. Um, and you can't get your time back unless you're able to spend money to get your time back. Um, so I'm doing things like that, you know, growth. I don't know if I've talked about this yet on, on this podcast, but you know, growing is, is one of the hardest things that you can do because what you feel now, like if you're early in your stage or your journey, those, those, like, if you feel comparison, if you feel like you've got, you know, money's tied up, you're struggling to pay for bills and stuff, like all those emotions you're going to feel more and more of that as you continue to grow. Those things do not go away. I made an Instagram post on this um, talking about one of those is comparison. Like I, I think I was more confident early in my career than I am right now because I didn't know the people that I know now. I know people that are so much smarter than me that are so razor sharp. And I talk to them and I'm just like, like you, can, you just get blown back by their knowledge and their wisdom. They're like, you are so on top of your shit. Holy crap. You know, you meet these people and then, and then you can compare yourself. So there's more comparison because you're meeting more people. Um, you know, same thing with, with money. I don't know if we talked about this, but I made an example of, you know, if you have, if you have, you're struggling with bills and groceries and things, you're worried about that. Well, when you grow, you might worry about covering your costs for payroll or, you know, paying a contractor or an editor or whatever. Those thoughts and emotions and feelings, they still feel the same. The problem has shifted. It's a different problem, but it's still a problem. And there's more of that as you, as you continue to evolve. When I got this apartment, this is a new apartment in LA, you know, I was like, do I deserve this? This seems like too big. Am I at the level to be paying for this? Should I be paying for this? Like, oh, I should probably just live in a shack so I could put all my money into my business and, and, and grow it. You know, it's like all these, all this self-doubt creeps in. Like, oh, people are going to talk shit about me. You know, imposter syndrome. Yeah, all these different thoughts and emotions continue to grow and, and get harder as you up level. But your mindset also needs to match it too. So you get stronger, mentally stronger. Um, and that's why people talk about that the journey is what makes you the person that you know, you're, you're trying to become. You have to become the person that you're trying to become to, to get where you want to go. But those, you're not going to get there unless you, um, unless you make that decision to, to do it, you know? Speaking of the journey, I want to jump back to the beginning of the pretty early in the journey, we'll say. Do you remember the message you got on when you had around 270 subscribers on YouTube? 
the message that I got around. You had a message on Instagram and it was around, the message was, I'll just, it's kind of a hard question to set up, but it's when you had 270 subscribers on YouTube, someone messaged you asking why you keep making videos if nobody's watching. Do you remember what you said? Oh, yes. Wow. Damn. Where did you find that one? Was that on my Instagram page or? I can't remember if it was an old video or if I heard a podcast. I think it was an old video. I think. Damn. Man, you did your work. Madness. Um, yeah, I, I received that question. That's, I did not like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was not cool. Um, so, so what are you asking? Like what, how did that make me feel? Or I think, well, my original question like- is going to be if you remember the message. And my question was, I I remember it now. Yeah. Now that you said it, I remember it. Yeah. How often do you reflect on everything that's happened since you got that message? Like how often do you reflect on this crazy journey that you've been on? I need to do more of it. I need to reflect more because, you know, when, when I start feeling anxious or I'm sorry, I'm starting to feel worried or whatever, like myself from four years ago would have like, kick myself in the nuts for even coming close to thinking that you know what i mean like when when i was in college i had just all i wanted was to be home and just have access to a car to go drive to my favorite gym and lift weights all i wanted that's it you know and now you just take that so like well, now I can't drive to the gym right now. So I guess I lost that. Shoot. <laughs> Damn you, COVID. Um, but you know what I mean? Like you just, you take that shit so much for granted. What I wanted back then is I have that times a thousand right now. And so those are the, the, those are the, the reflections that I need to continue to have more of. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a beautiful, a beautiful reminder. Um, you know, even my buddy kind of had that moment for a second too. My, my buddy, he has, a, he has an R8 and we were driving and, and uh, he was talking about like, yeah, man, like this car just, you know, just doesn't do what that McLaren does. And I'm like, fuck you, dude. Like, I don't have an R8. <laughs> I'm just like, fuck you. And I kind of put him in his place that I'm like, I would kill for this car right now, you know? And, um, and he just kind of had a moment of of reflection there. So yeah, it needs to be done. You need to, you need to compare yourself to who you were. And, and and it's hard to do that. I understand with like social media. I mean, it's so hard. You know, one of the things that I've done is created a new Instagram that I only follow 20 people. And it's the, it's the, the account, like whenever I sign out or just like quit, I make sure I'm in that account. So that when I open it back up, that's the first account that I see. And it just becomes that second layer of filtering of like, should I be on Instagram right now? Uh, Do I need to be looking at what other people I'm doing? Because people that I'm following on my Instagram, I still want to follow them because I've got close relationships. I like them. Um, I've got friends on there, business relationships and things like that. Um, I still want to follow those people but it's just chaos. Like whenever I open the app, it's chaos. I'm being told to hustle and grind. I'm like, I'm being told that, uh, oh man, like my work is, I need to, I need to get better at my photography. You know, (laughs) if you want to think about it that way, it's probably a negative mindset to have, but it's hard not to do that. That That's my point. And so I created this Instagram, just follow people that give me energy that I know that looking at that stuff is like, oh yeah, that could give me an idea, a source of inspiration, whatever. And that's helped a ton. Like this is the most I've been off Instagram and it's been fantastic. Like, like I talked about a little earlier in this podcast, like coming, taking yourself out of your business. You know, I just use social media as connection and things like that, but mainly just business really. And like, as soon as I'm done doing whatever I needed to do, whether it's supporting other people, I still try to support other people as best I can. Um, and, and, or post. Or, you know, write something that inspired me. As soon as I'm done with that, I get the fuck off. I'm done. And then, you know, um, I, I, I create little pockets of time for myself throughout the day to get back onto it, to do whatever I need to do. But yeah, I'm trying to stay away from it as much as I can. And it's, it's helped so much. I, I, I have energy to create more. I have energy to uh, be more inspired. Like, I have more ideas now. 
from it, you know? So. No, I love that. That was one of my 2021 goals was to use social media mindlessly less, like with my business and stuff, like I have to be on it for clients, mm-hmm. but like personal time, like I'm trying to monitor how much time I'm actually spending on it. So I love that. But I know we're, we're, we're a little over time here. So I'm just going to jump to my last question. That I ask everybody at the end of every interview and I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. So pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question. You'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? Do we live in a simulation? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I would ask. I want to know. Um, I don't know if that's really the answer you're looking for, but I like to think about those things because it does make life feel more like a game. And when it feels more like a game, more often than not, you're going to treat it that way and have more fun with it. So I like to think of it as a game. And, um, and so I like to ask those big questions. It just, it makes me, less self-centered it makes me less egotistical and less about myself and like whenever we get anxious and we start feeling imposter syndrome it's because we're thinking about how we look and who we are and and whatever but when you when you truly think that some type of meteor can come and just wipe us all out like we're all the same we're all equal here and we're just living this life and um I, I like to just think about those. I'm a, I'm a big space nerd. So I just like to think about those things and it just calms me down. Like, why am I nervous about meeting someone? Like, we're just human. We're all the same here. I know it's hard to do that because they might have some skill and talent and experiences, but it just creates more of that equal playing field. And I, I like that. No, I like that answer. I like the reason behind the answer too. Cause sometimes you get those, like the copy paste, like what happens when we die? And like, that's just kind of the end of the question, but I like the reason behind the question. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for taking all this time to be on the podcast. I want to give you the floor Where can the people Dude. find you plug anything and everything you got right now. Yeah. So, um, just come say hi on my Instagram. I, first of all, I apologize for losing my train of thought a million times and going in a different directions, but you asked some really good questions it really made me think. Um, but yeah, come, come hang on the, on my Instagram and I answer all my DMS. Um, I've got a podcast that people really like, so they say, um, so come hang, it's called Ramblin' Radio. Um, and then my Instagram page is, is just at Zach Kravitz, C-A-C-K-K-R-A-B-I-T-S and, and just come say hi and I'll, I'll say hi back and let me know if I can ever be of service. So thanks for having me on Jacob. I really, this was a phenomenal interview you got got something special here so i appreciate it thank you i appreciate that and like i said i appreciate taking time to be on the show and i want to thank everybody for listening whether you've listened the entire way through you only listen to bits and pieces i really appreciate you taking time to check this out everyone do me a big favor go and follow zach on instagram go and subscribe to his podcast i'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so you can find it if you'd like to follow me you can find me everywhere on social media at the jacob kelly feel free to come and say hello my dms are always open if you'd like to follow the podcast you can find us on instagram and at my social life podcast or youtube by searching up my social life As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.